music mimics life in the sense that what life is is a series of patterns that transform. And what the Bible contains is a list of stories. And what you're to do when you read the Bible is you are to extract out the modes of being, the patterns of being that are represented there and integrate them into your own life so that your life is like the music of the word. It's a physiological sensation. It's a psychological sensation. When it's right, you feel it. And when it's wrong, I would say you, you feel it likewise. These sounds that we hear in music, they are stories. They mean something to us and they mean something very real. As the culture turns its back on God, many Christians are missing out on the fulfilling life God has for his people. That's why we created the Inner Fire Podcast. Join me, Andrew Carroll, and my dad, Scotty, as we confront modern complexities with timeless truth so that you can be equipped to live out the word. We hope this podcast is a blessing to you. Welcome back. We're here again talking about leisure, and today we're continuing our conversation about entertainment. Last time we talked about movies and TV and things that we watch on our screens and what some of the spiritual hazards might be there. But that is just one of many parts of the entertainment that we consume. And another big one is music. So we want to spend a little bit of time talking about music, the power of it, what kind of music we ought to be listening to, and so on. Do you have anything you want to say as we open up? I guess I would just say if, if we didn't step on your toes last time, maybe we can today. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Uh, maybe, gotcha. If, maybe if music is your thing uh, and movies and TV are not, then, uh, you know, honestly, we just want to, you know, we're not legalist about, you know, if you think about what we're going to say here and, and what we're really going to explore is, you know, is there's a lot of discussion to be had around it. You know, we're not trying to be a legalist. We're trying to get people to think hmm. about the fact that what they're doing with their leisure and music specifically here, you know, is it moving them closer to God? Is it moving them further away from God? What about their kids and grandkids? Mm -hmm. what, what example are they setting for them? Mm -hmm. How is, you know, are we just becoming more Christ-like? Which, right. as we've talked about in other settings, you know, us being more Christ-like is what is needed to positively influence our families, our churches, our communities, and ultimately our nation. I mean, the mess that we're in is because we're not living out the Word. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. But we're in a place where we can make a huge difference, each of us individually, and it's little bitty steps. So you may say, hey, what I'm listening to with music doesn't really make a difference, but it's those small incremental steps that get us somewhere bigger. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There can be no room for less than good and righteous behavior. I think the question people want to ask a lot, especially when it comes to the sort of things we're talking about today is, is this okay? Is this okay? Is this okay? It's the wrong question. The right question is, is this good? Is this right? Is this honoring to the Lord? Does this glorify the Lord? The things that are going to answer yes to that question are a lot smaller uh, category than the things that are okay right mm -hmm. all things are lawful but not all, all things are helpful it's one that's good to go back to when we're talking about this kind of stuff well and and the things that we're talking about with leisure you know you can do any one of the okay things and the next day you might not know the difference but if you continually do that, there's a compounding effect that will be noted, not only by yourself, maybe not by yourself, maybe you're not paying attention, 
but by others around you will note the difference. And so, you know, that's what we want people to get. You know, mm-hmm. it's just like we said when we talked about health. I can eat a piece of chocolate cake today and tomorrow I'm fine. But the compounding effects takes me somewhere yep. where I do not want to be. And music has the potential to do the same thing if we're not taking in the right kind of music. Mm-hmm. I think that when you're talking about that, you also have to factor in the opportunity cost. It's not just that you're going to pay for these repeated actions, but you're also not getting all of the benefit that you could if you were to input good things, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And music is very powerful. I think that uh, this account of David and Saul really illustrates that. Um, The Bible says, whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul... This is after God's anointing left Saul and came upon David. David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. I think that it is a pretty universal experience that music has this effect. It can move us in our inner selves, right? And the question is, what is it? moving us toward what is it moving us away from right Mm -hmm. i I like matthew henry's commentary on this passage he says not only can you drive away a bad spirit with music but you can drive away the good spirit so the question is which music does what Mm -hmm. (laughs) right Mm -hmm. and that should be our gauge for what kind of music we ought to listen to. So does that mean that all we ever listen to is CCM and Southern gospel and stay away from all that secular music? What do you think? No, I don't think so. Uh, But I think we have to be careful when we're, when we're listening to any type of music. I mean, here's the truth of the matter. Uh, You know, there's some stuff playing on CCM stations uh, if you will, uh, you know, that many of us listen to the radio anymore. A lot of us listen to downloaded music. There's a lot of music put out by artists that is not necessarily correct theologically and mm-hmm. may not be giving us the right idea of who God is or who we are. Uh, you know, that music, just because it's got, got a Christian label on it, doesn't necessarily mean it's good and by the same token, there's some secular music you can listen to that could calm your spirit, that could move you in a, in a right way to, to think about God. Certainly, you know, some forms of music like classical music, I think, would have that effect. You know, when David was playing on the lyre or the, the harp or whatever, uh, you know, whatever he was playing there, I wonder what he was playing. You know, it wasn't Amazing Grace. They hadn't come up with that one yet. Mm-hmm. Uh it was it was he playing psalms was he playing what what kind of tune was it i think mm-hmm. it was probably something that we would fit into the genre of classical just mm-hmm. well it's instrumental yeah yeah and i think that that's worth noting because hmm, was the music that david was playing sacred or secular i think that that distinction between sacred and secular is a dull instrument so to speak (laughs) it's an out of tune instrument usually when people are making the distinction between sacred and secular they're referring to the lyrics Mm -hmm. but there's a lot more to music than the lyrics in fact music is much more the sound of the instruments than it is the words that are said by a singer. Obviously, Mm -hmm. there's plenty of music without any words at all. And is there, is all of that music, which is the majority of it, just morally neutral? I think that there's some music with so-called Christian words, the sound of which is displeasing to the Lord. But that is a lot more complicated to parse out. And so most people just avoid the conversation completely. But I think that's a mistake. 
Well, I mean, I know you having a degree in music, music ministry, uh, you have spent a great deal of time looking at this. You have been in many different music environments, Mm -hmm. uh, both inside and outside of church. You've played and sung many different types of music. So, you know, I would say you're as expert on this (laughs) as most people. Uh, more expert than most people. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe there's somebody out there that knows more about it than you do, but I think you have thought about it enough to really speak into it, as you were saying, on what what constitutes, you know, what uh, what are the parameters of music or the characteristics of music that we should be listening to right. rather than, you know, is it, what kind of label has someone put on it? Secular, mm-hmm. sacred, or whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, what what do you what do you say are those characteristics? What do you look for, or what distinguishing factors might there be? What kind of guidance can you give people on that? Well, I don't know how good an idea it is to let me off the leash on this one because I could talk about it for a long time, and I will tell our listeners that we did a whole podcast on music that was a compilation of previous podcasts as well as some original material in our last season, which you can go and and check out. And I would recommend that. What I'm looking for in music is something that is beautiful and something that is drawing me upward and not downward. And I know that's vague, but I think that it's worked out through a watchfulness over one's heart, mind, and spirit. I think that you can sense which way the music is pulling you. And I think that our fixation on lyrics has led to some, I'll say, dark and displeasing sounds being labeled as Christian. Sounds and style traits that have been borrowed from um, dark and sinful forms of music and then repurposed as Christian. And we think, well, we can and should listen to that because it has good lyrics, meanwhile ignoring the the sound of it and the way that those patterns and those um, timbres and the things that make up the substance of the music influence us. So I think of um, Christian rap, for example. I think there's some good Christian rap out there, but I would probably consider it a minority. I think that a lot of those hip hop style beats they have an effect that cannot simply be ignored um, in favor of, we'll say, Christian lyrics, which even the lyrical conversation, I think, is not nearly as sophisticated as it should be because what it also seems to imply is that something is only Christian if it is expressly about God, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if that's the gauge, then we could say that some books in the Bible are not Christian, right? They're secular writings. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that they're not pleasing to God. That doesn't mean they they don't impact our hearts and our lives in a way that is pleasing to him and and so on. So, uh, yeah, I don't think the conversation about music is uh, anywhere where it needs to be, and it's starting to affect our worship in church, which is concerning to me. It used to be the case that the world followed Christian music. Now it's the case that Christian music follows the world. Now, the reason that's the case is because popular music is now, um, is now secular, right? Mm -hmm. The, The music of the people is secular music, whereas before, if you wanted to be a musician, you had to be a part of the church because of the way the church was aligned with the government and had a monopoly on academia and and all like that. Not saying we should go back to that necessarily, but what I am saying is 
because the popular idiom, that is to say, the style in which we all sing sort of in our folk music is not hymns, right? The hymn format is one that is, it's not a part of our, the common tongue musically. What is part of the common tongue is verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, right? Mm -hmm. So the new Christian music is being done in that format. And I think rightly so. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But that's just an example of one of the things that we're adopting from the popular music of our day. There are many others. And I think that with every one that we integrate into our worship music, we need to take a really hard look at it. So you covered a lot of ground there. Um, let's, I guess, back up a little bit and just say, okay, the, what we're really talking about, I mean, there, there's two things to talk about here. Well, I mean, one thing would be the church, the, the music inside church. Right, we could we could talk about that extensively. Yeah. I think I think the thing that probably we should spend more time talking on is when you take out your iPad or your uh, your iPhone and select make a selection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What should I be looking for there? Mm -hmm. And you noted, you know, uh, earlier about how the music makes you feel. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think that music generally? makes most people feel the same way. In other words, if you have a an aggressive, hard beat, does that elicit the same response from the vast majority of people such that we could kind of put a, a, a barrier around that and say this is not the kind of feeling we want or might you listen to one thing and get a feeling and I listen to it and get a totally different feeling? Does that make sense? Yes, yes, that does make sense. It is certainly the case that music is not so objective that you can just slap a label on it for now and all time. Jazz music, which we now consider posh and elegant, was once considered um, buried low down, dirty, of low repute it that's because of the sort of people it was associated with mm -hmm. right um like elvis used to be considered sort of the uh, representative of all things sinful in culture now christians look back on elvis with great fondness right and elvis's music sounds totally innocent to us Mm -hmm. And we don't we don't feel dirty after we listen to it, whereas someone back in the day might have. So yes, it's it's not as simple as well. This sound equals this. There mm -hmm. are cultural factors that come to bear on how the music affects us. Mm -hmm. So then, <laughs> how do we make a decision if I'm trying to evaluate? Is this music that I should be listening to? You know, if we were having this conversation in Elvis's heyday, mm -hmm. and you, would you sit over there and say, you don't need to be listening to Elvis, but now you say, yeah, yeah, go ahead and listen to Elvis, or is, you know, how do I make those decisions? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it, the decisions that I make today, are they going to be applicable to my kids, to my grandkids, or mm -hmm. how do we sort through this? I mean, what we're really trying to do here. You know, we're trying to inspire people to live out the word and what they take in. Mm -hmm. So when they listen to a song, how do they know this is really good for me or this is really bad? You know, you said you you like things that lift you upward. Uh, yeah. Well, that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Is, is there any way we can hone in on this? Well... The first thing I would say is if you're questioning it, that might be a good indication that it's questionable, right? And, and what time do any of us have for questionable things, right? So that's one thing, not a concrete answer, yeah. but we could use that as a gauge. Now, what you've pointed out is that there is something relative to all of this. And people hate that word relative. They hate the word relativism 
because they think that as soon as something is labeled as relative, basically what that means is that it is no longer real. So if you can say, well, it was wrong here, but it's not wrong here, mm -hmm. they're saying that's relativistic and now the distinction is com completely null, but that's right. not the case, right? Now, relative to our context, some things which might be bad or might be good, might be good or might be bad respectively, that doesn't mean that they are not good or bad in our context, right? So I think that you just have to, you have to take note of what the music means and what it means to you in your particular context. Yeah, all that makes me a little uncomfortable. I mean, because it, it is, like you say, that's that's very relative, right, to to the culture of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, what I want to do is look at a, a piece of music and say, okay, how does this music relate to the unchanging standard of the Bible? What is it doing to me relative to the Bible? You know, Elvis is a good example. You know, he was, you know, he was hated by parents <laughs> of teenagers in the day yeah. uh, because of he was taking taking it in places it had never been before and opening a can of worms that they didn't want opened up. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, all those people that were listening are grandparents and they're happy to share it with their grandkids. They think Elvis is still cool. Uh, but, you know, is he? I mean, is is it something that we should be listening to still? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I, how can it be that relative? It doesn't make, it doesn't quite make sense to me that it can be relative only to the context of the of today. And we can make the decision just based on what the culture is. And it was bad in the 70s, but it's, it's good in, the, in 2020. Well, it's not relative to the context only mm -hmm. of the day. I think that's, that's definitely true. I think that there is, there is music that is very old and it has been regarded very favorably, is now considered a classic, mm -hmm. whether it be in the in popular music or in classical music that is absolutely wrong. Yeah. I, I, so there is something that's deeper than that for sure. Mm -hmm. And without going into a very complex analysis of what music is and how we experience it as human beings, what I will say is, it can only it can only be worked out through a watchfulness over one's spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, you know, as I said at, at the onset here, that's part of what we need to do is we need to question yeah. what we're listening to, yeah. which we often don't because we listen to something and we enjoy it. Okay, why do we enjoy something? Because it with music, you know, I feel like what musicians are trying to do, I, I, I was at an event here recently uh, with a, a famous Nashville songwriter, mm -hmm. and he basically said, what are we trying to do? He said, I'm trying to tell my story in a way that connects with your story. I want, if you listen to my song and I'm singing my story, but it's really your story, yeah. then I got a successful song, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so... What is that connection? It's bringing back a feeling or something like that to a previous time in our life, maybe a struggle we went through. It's bringing back a flood of good memories because it's connecting us to grandma or grandpa and the good old days. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, so there's a lot of that kind of stuff that goes on. And you say, okay, just because I'm having these great memories of, you know, when grandpa rode me around on the tractor or taught me how to shoot a gun or whatever the, the song might be, uh, you know, it's kind of morally neutral. It's just a just gives me a warm fuzzy. And so, is that good or bad? You know, should I be listening to that or not? I mean, I, these are difficult questions. Mm -hmm. But the, I think these are the kind of questions that, you know, if we're going to say examine your music, I think we have to either, you know, we we got to give some kind of way for people to distinguish that. Mm -hmm. I think you know, there's some more verses maybe that we should read that that speak more to the music. But I think 
we have to understand, as the verse you read, music does connect with our spirit in a way that words alone will not. Mm -hmm. You know, God built us to receive music. He created music. Uh, You know, the birds sing. I mean, that's musical, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm -hmm. uh, to me, when I sit on the beach and the waves come in, yeah. That's rhythmic, mm-hmm. you know, and there's a there's a certain it's a sound. Maybe yep. it's not music per se, but it has a calming uh, of my spirit. And mm-hmm. so, sounds and rhythms and things like that definitely impact us. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, anyway, I, I'm kind of rambling here, but how do we get down to? Yeah, this is good. Or I mean, even just to give somebody a guide, you know, of think mm-hmm. about these things. Hmm. Right, right. That's a tough question. I tell you what, we could we could start with a, a really simple one. So what about explicit music? Now, so explicit music, what does that mean? Basically, it means music that has some kind of cursing in it. I'm not sure if that's all it means, but for the most part... That's yeah, I would means. say to me, explicit would be language and sexual content. I mean, you find that yeah. in a lot of, you know, harder, harder sure. yeah. music. Uh, and so to me, that would be that would be part of it. Uh, mm-hmm. Not just the language, but the topics that are covered. Right. Right. Uh, you know, I don't I mean, if you look at if you look at country music. You know, uh, it, there could be language and, and explicit subjects in there. I think a lot of what we're talking about with explicit music is going to be rap and hip hop and yep. that type of stuff. Country music tends to talk more about getting drunk and running around with your wife and cheating and those kind of things. Not explicit, but not necessarily topics that we want to be dwelling on. Uh, maybe, <laughs> you know, depending on the angle of the song. Mm-hmm. But, <clears throat> you know, so anyway... How do we? You said start with start with something easy, explicit yeah. music. I do think that is an easy place to start because there should be a little bit more universal uh, agreement on that. Mm-hmm. I would hope. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So explicit music. We kind of already talked about the issue of foul language when we were talking about foul language in movies and TV. There is the fact that it will make you more likely to use foul language yourself. You can debate about that if you want, whether or not Christians should be using foul language. I don't think ultimately the question is that complicated, although you can make it complicated if you want to. But I think that if you were to say, well, I'm not going to listen to explicit music, you might rule out a few songs that really are not a a problem. But that's one rule that keeps you from having to make a hundred other rules, right? It When you eliminate explicit music you eliminate so much of what you shouldn't be listening to that it just simplifies your life that might be a reason to do it so you know that might be one kind of easy marker that we could make we could get more complex and you know if you want to go there we can but um, I think that it's going to be probably a little bit above our heads and maybe a little bit above our audience's heads, maybe a little bit more than uh, they don't say bargain don't, for. Don't say anything that's above my head. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't want to look ignorant here. But uh. but if I were to go there, basically what it would look like is something like this: What music is is a series of patterns that transform. And they transform at a certain rate. Now, when I say that about patterns, a lot of people are going to immediately assume I'm talking about rhythm. But I'm also talking about harmony because harmony ultimately comes down to the same thing. So if I tap on the, that's right here. That's a rhythm. Mm -hmm. But if I were to tap on the desk 440 times in a second, what you would hear is a concert a right now what that basically means is that a pitch is (laughs) 
it is that many vibrations within mm -hmm. within a space of a second. That's how we determine what they are. Well, if I were to do it at the rate of 220 times per second, that would be the A an octave below. Well, if I did it at the rate of um, 880 times a second, it would be the octave above. So then all of these little ratios, like what if I did, well, so like there it's one to two, right? Mm -hmm. um, 440 to 880, that's a one to two ratio that represents a harmonic consonance, right? Well, then if I did one to three, it would be the E above that higher A, and that represents the consonance of a fifth. So just as in drumming, you play at different ratios. So you got the kick drum, right? Let's say you do the, the kick drum on every beat and you do the snare on two and four. Mm -hmm. That's a one to two relationship. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing in harmony. It's, it's relationships. It's things that recur at certain rates. And then those things have to change across the dimension of time. Now, what does all that mean? What all of that means is that music mimics life in the sense that what life is, is a series of patterns that transform. If there were no patterns in life, we couldn't see anything. We couldn't do everything. We would be totally overwhelmed by chaos. And what the Bible contains is a list of stories. And what you're to do when you read the Bible is you are to extract out the modes of being, the patterns of being that are represented there and integrate them into your own life so that you um, basically, your, to use a very artsy kind of phrase, your life is like the music of the word. Mm -hmm. Okay. So <clears throat> essentially we're taking our life, if we view it as an instrument and we're tuning it, right? Yes. When you tune something, you're adjusting the frequency of the pitch. Mm -hmm. You're, a, you're tuning it to align with the Bible. So if you, if you go to a concert and you, so you see somebody up there tuning their guitar, which they always do. <laughs> Nobody ever comes on stage with a tuned guitar. You ever <laughs> notice that? They always tune it after they get up there. They're always tweaking it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But the, the piano and the rhythm guitar and the lead guitar all have to be tuned so that when they hit uh, an A, mm -hmm. it's all at the same frequency. So mm -hmm. essentially what we're trying to do, what you're saying is, tune ourselves. the frequency of the Bible is the standard. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to mm -hmm. tune to that pitch. That's, yeah, that's certainly a way of looking at it. Another yeah. way of looking at it is the Bible is a song that you're trying to play along with, mm -hmm. right? Or it's, it's a, a melody that you're, that you're trying to get in the, the groove of. You're trying to follow the path of it. Mm -hmm. So then what's the difference between music that's pleasing to God and music that's not pleasing to God? I think as hard as this is to wrap your mind around, basically what it is, it is a pattern that it's a pattern of life that evolves, right? That's Christian living. Then the music is a pattern that revol that uh, evolves and transforms in such a way as to represent that. Mm -hmm. Now, people think that music is the least representative form of art. Jordan Peterson, I think, aptly recognizes that it is the most representative form of art. We think like a, a painting. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, it looks just like you. You know, it represents right. you. But see, pure image, that may not be as much of uh, what reality actually consists of as we think that it does mm -hmm. and maybe what reality actually consists of patterns that transform is represented better by music and i think that all of us would say that we are more easily moved emotionally and otherwise by music than we are by paintings and i think that that's just further further evidence for that yeah absolutely i mean that's i think i think most people would agree with that nothing against art and paintings, but uh, music does tend to move people. You, you, you stand them in front of, 
you know, I'm on a lease or something like that. You know, maybe a few people cry over it, but you listen to a song, uh, a lot more people are going to cry if it's that type of song. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And when you, if you were to just take a measure of music and play it over and over and over again, it would be a pattern. Mm -hmm. But if there was no transformation, it would not be beautiful. Mm -hmm. Right. If you play it and it changes a little bit, well, then that's better. And if it changes too much, that's worse. There's something in between. It's the correct mm -hmm. rate of transformation. Mm -hmm. It's that melodic um, variation in the last chorus. It's the changing of the chord progression that just when you're listening to it, fills you with a sense of awe and brings you to tears and so on, right? It's that sort of mediation between chaos and order that is representative of a life well lived. So that is about the best I can do at demonstrating how music can be good. So what you're saying to bring it, bring it back to a guideline that we can share that somebody could actually apply, mm -hmm. you know, we're not going to dissect every song we listen to into what, you know, the chord structure and the, the, yeah. the progressions and the, the transformations, but we can understand how it makes us feel mm -hmm. and does it seem to move us more in alignment with God's word when we listen to it? Are we more likely to produce the fruit of the spirit in our lives? Are we more likely to be kind? Are we more likely to be loving? Are we more likely to think pure thoughts or are we more likely to slide toward chaos? You know, when or I think towards it, hyper order, yeah. Yeah, when I think of uh, when I think of what you were saying, you know, I the chaos end of things to me is like white noise, right? You know, there is no pattern to it; it's just all over the place, and it just it it's obviously it's just put there to drown things out. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And so I think that's what we're really trying to get people to question. When you listen to a song, which direction is it moving you? Is it, is it, is it stirring up the feeling of doing something that you really shouldn't be doing? Uh, whether it's, yeah, I'm going to go have that drink because I deserve it because he deserved it in this song. I'm just making something up. But, mm -hmm. you know, what is it that it's moving you toward? That's what we want people to think about. And I don't mm -hmm, know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we can give any better guideline than that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we can just simply say, you know, explicit music. I think you listen to it. It's going to have that effect on you. Good music uh, should. I, I'm, I'm trying to think of some obvious examples that would move you the other way that we could mm. just put on the table, and then there's going to be some there's going to be some stuff yeah. in the middle. Yeah, that's that's a gray area. Yeah, well, you know, music doesn't come from nowhere, right? Like, look at since we've been picking on hip hop and rap, um, look at rap music. Where did it come from? What sort of lifestyle did the people who brought it uh, into existence, what kind of lifestyle did they have? I think what you'll find is you can see some kind of consonance between the lifestyle and the music itself. They're, they're representing similar patterns mm -hmm. of being. Now, this whole pattern analysis thing, to tell you the truth, if I were to try to do that in a concrete way, I'm not even sure where I would start. But you don't really have to because when because it's a physiological sensation, it's a psychological sensation. When it's right, you feel it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You feel it deep down. You, and when it's wrong, I would say you, you feel it likewise. Now, what you said earlier about the person who deserves a drink or whatever. See, it might seem silly to some people, but that's a story, right? And these patterns, they're, they're like stories. These sounds that we hear in music, they are stories. They mean something to us, and they mean something very real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So take that for what it's worth. There's some great, great music out there for sure. And I am amazed. In, in preparation for this podcast, I listened to some of the top 100 music. 
I was expecting it to be filthy in terms of its content lyrically, but I was amazed at how artistically poor it was, right? Mm -hmm. And that to me is almost as offensive, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's a lot of good music out there. And as I say, there's just no time to waste with the, the lesser stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's music. I think we should move on from there. I want to hit briefly on video games. It takes up a lot of our time. Mm -hmm. You know, video games, a lot of the content of them is similar to the content of, say, movies and TV in that you're consuming it through a screen. Of course, you're interfacing with it in a different way. Uh, so what I'm saying is we may have already covered some stuff mm -hmm. that has to do with video games, but I want to give you a chance to say some things about it. Well, video games are like a lot of things uh, of today. You know, from their inception, they have gone from something, you know, I mean, you know, I'm old enough to remember when the first, I dare I even say, video games came mm -hmm. out. You mm -hmm. know, we were... We, we sat there and we had these little knobs that controlled a paddle that moved up and down on the screen and we played tennis back and forth, you know, me and me and my brothers. Uh, that was a video game, right? And then we went to Pac-Man and yeah. Defender and, you know, all these different types. Sure, now sure. everything is photorealistic, mm -hmm. shoot 'em ups where we're just destroying people and cities and everything in our wake. Mm -hmm. And, I you know, I haven't played a video game in years, so I don't have firsthand knowledge. I only know what I've heard. Yeah. Uh, but there's one, you know, there's one com. I'm not going to say that all video games are bad, but I, you know, one thing that I note right away with video games is that people spend an inordinate amount of time doing them. And best I can tell, video games are not producing any new skill set in you <laughs> that's useful for life. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> and, you know, so I would just say, number one with video games, evaluate the time being spent on it. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, is it good stewardship of time? Yeah. Are you improving yourself? Are you uh, growing closer to God? Are you being of service to others? So that'd be the first thing. And then from there, you got to go to the content, which to me, we could talk about the content, but that basically is going to align with everything that we talked about in entertainment. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, in these video games, you know, the language, the images, uh, uh, both from a, a violence and a sexual standpoint are very graphic and I believe take our mind in a bad direction. Mm -hmm. And, we, you know, you sit there, we, we can, people can say what you want to. You sit there and you take that in time and time and time again. You become desensitized to it, yeah. and you get you're more likely to play out what you what you see in some form. It doesn't mean you're going to go kill somebody. Not in that. That's not what I'm talking about. But just in how you relate to other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's not just taking it in. Video games present an opportunity to do it yourself in a sense. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're watching a movie, you're empathizing with the characters. You know, you're kind of imagining that you're them. And that's why when they get sad, you feel sad and, and so on, right? Mm -hmm. You are kind of making yourself an avatar of the character. But th that is the same and more in video games mm -hmm. in that you are, you are controlling the character and you are um, really interacting with that character's reality. So yes, that's something to note. And, and while I'm talking about that, I think that the tendency to escape reality through video games is probably um, the highest in terms of forms of entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. I think that more than anything else, video games are coming to become so realistic that they resemble reality. Mm-hmm. They come to sim be a simulation. They come to be a world in themselves that people would rather live in than this one, mm -hmm. an issue that we have talked about at length. And I would encourage you to, to listen to that in our technology series. So beware of that as well. And I think that that escapism, which is true of movies, even true of music, but I think the most true of video games 
um, that escapism is something that we should be very wary of. Yeah, we definitely, with video games, probably more so than the other thing, we enter into a different world. Quite, I mean, not literally, but we feel like we're in a different world. You know, we are that person roaming a different world. Mm -hmm. And we can be very powerful in that world. Yeah. And we can have a lot of characteristics that we like. That we wish we had in the real world. Yes. Yeah, no wonder we spend so much time on it. Yeah. Well, let's hit on one more thing since we're running low on time. Something that comes to bear on really everything we've discussed, all forms of entertainment up to this point, be it movies, TV shows, music, or video games, humor and comedy. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you have your stand-up comedians, and that's all they do. That's very much their object. But we, of course, also see humor and comedy in our movies and and especially TV shows and, and so on. What should our approach to that be? Because I think all of us would recognize at some level that laughter and making light of things, making witty observations about things and so on is good. But at some point, I think we would also recognize it crosses a line Mm -hmm. to where things that should not be made light of are being made light of and things that deserve reverence are being treated with irreverence and so on. So what should our approach be to comedy? Well, I would start by saying laughter is good. You know, Reader's Digest always had a section, still do. Laughter, the best medicine. Mm. Uh, You know, laughing is good for the soul, right? And so there's nothing wrong with laughter. I, I think people should laugh. They should enjoy life. Uh, but, you know, with a lot of things, we we take something that's really good and we, we mess it up by laughing at things that are not, that shouldn't be funny, right? That, uh, you know, myself, to me, a comedian that uses language and uh, sex to get a laugh is, he's, you know, he's not a real comedian comedian to me. I mean, he, he's he's taking the easy way out. Mm-hmm. There's so many things that are uh, on a much higher plane <laughs> that can be made light of in a fun way. Uh, really, we, we wind up laughing at ourselves a lot of times. Mm-hmm. That's the best kind of laughter. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I would say, as we've said in other, it, it, avoid explicit stuff. There's really no need for it. It's, it's Whatever laughter we might get out of it is doesn't make up for the negative consequences of taking in the material as a whole. Uh, mm. Seek out the things that are uh, that are more poke more fun at ourselves, or that we can see ourselves in, or see somebody else that we know in, without making that person the 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 brunt of our joke. You know, laughing at somebody else or laughing at their expense is not very kind. It's not very loving. It's not, doesn't meet the do unto others as you would uh, have them do unto you. That It doesn't meet any of those criteria, Hmm. especially when we do it in a public way. But even in a private setting, when we're making someone else the brunt of the joke, that's not really favorable mm. that that's that's where i would start well comedy i think i look at comedy as a form of truth telling mm-hmm. and i'm going to use that term kind of loosely the truth is a sword and it cuts and the truth can be used <laughs> yeah <laughs> it can be used to hurt yeah <laughs> used <laughs> that was funny <laughs> <laughs> yeah the truth it can be used to hurt i, I kind of hit on this last time when i was talking about people who uh, hide their meanness behind the guise of honesty You can say something, make an observation about somebody that might be factually correct, but is hurtful, right? Now, 
insofar as comedy reveals some sort of truth, it can be used in the same way. Mm -hmm. And the whole notion of having a laugh at someone's expense, uh, I think demonstrates that very well, the fact that that's even a thing. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say a good joke is something that reveals something that is funny. Usually something that's funny and surprising. Mm -hmm. the, the best kind of humor is the kind of humor that just reveals these sort of little absurdities of life that we all are sort of blind to and mm -hmm. it makes us look at things in a new way. Okay, I think what that means ultimately though is that to the degree that you have access to the truth, you will be able to tell what jokes are good and what jokes are not good. Because some jokes, they're trying to point out something that's true, mm -hmm. but it's not really true. And therefore, it's not really funny. You know, th <laughs> this is why, you know, right-wingers, they have their comedians that they like, and left-wingers mm -hmm. have their comedians that they like. The right-wingers think the left-wing comedians are not funny, and vice versa. Well, why is it? Because the right-wingers don't think what the left-wing comedians, the truths that they're revealing, are true. Right. Therefore, they don't find them funny. Right. And obviously the same goes both ways. Well, to the degree that you have access to genuine truth, knowledge and understanding, you will laugh at things that really are funny and not at things that really aren't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's all we have time for today. We've really hung on uh, these topics. We, we intended to talk about more today, but we'll have to save it for next time. I hope that what we've said has been um, helpful to people and will cause them to reevaluate their relationships with these things. What do you want to say in closing about music, video games, and comedy? Question what you're doing. Uh, if, it, if, it, if it just comes naturally, it might not be what you need to be doing. I mean, that's, an, you know, I don't, that's the way the Christian life is. Yeah. Oftentimes, I repeat myself from previous conversations, but being a Christ follower and walking in the steps of Christ does not come natural to us. So if we're doing something that seems completely natural, we need to check and see, mm -hmm. is that a Christ-like path that we're on? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, we want to be moving the right direction. You know, Christianity is not about sitting still. It's about improving our Christ likeness. It's about growing in Christ. Yeah. It's not about just checking a box. And so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, we have to do these things. All these topics that we've covered require us to do a self-examination. And that's, that's all we're asking people to do. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. The Christian life is not something you ever hit pause on. Mm -hmm. It's never something that you plateau in. You're always moving upward or downward. You never take a break and say, okay, I'm just going to flatline for a few minutes mm -hmm. so I can watch this, this TV show that's okay. Yeah. That's not how it works. You're either moving up and down, and maybe you're moving up and down at such regular intervals that it seems like you're staying in the same place. Mm -hmm. But again, there's the opportunity cost. How much higher could you be if you eliminated all those little things that are pulling you down, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How much more like Christ would you be? Kind of a haunting question. I think it's a question we all should sit with for a while. Absolutely. That's all we have time for today, but we will be back next time. We're going to be talking about hobbies that we have in our leisure time as well as sports, and we think you're really going to want to tune into that one. Um, we hope that this podcast has helped you live out the word in your own life. If it has, please share it with a friend or give us a high rating. And until next time, God bless you. Mm -hmm.